Hi, my name is Rich Baker, and this is Improv Breakdown. Thank you. I would say I improvised my career. Well done. Thank well you. Done. Welcome to Improv Breakdown. My name is Rich Baker. I'm super excited to have my very first guest on, longtime friend, amazing improviser, instructor, all-around badass, Natalie Shipman. Thank you so much for being on the show. No, thank you, Rich. Oh, That's my God. Good to be here. So good to see you. You too. We used to see each other all the time back in the day, and then, you know, life happened, different cities. Mm-hmm. Friendship, what are you going to do? Yeah. Uh, God, uh, we can start about a million different places. So, uh, I, you, you were on the Second City Tour Co. You were on Comedy Sports, Chicago's main ensemble. You're a co-founder of Vegas Improv Power, a co-founder of Vegas Theater Hub. You are improv through and through. You've got improv going every which way. 20 uh, years, Rich. 20 years this, this year? 20, 20 years this year, yes. Wow, nice. Yeah, very cool. Uh, so let's start with why, why did improv grab you in the first place? What was it about improv that made you go, I'll do that? Oh, man. Uh, I was a theater person. Uh, so I, from from a little kid, uh, I started um, doing scripted theater when I was in kindergarten because I was the only kid in the class who could memorize lines. Wow. So Congratulations. Me, thank you. Young prodigy. They, I was. Uh, they, so they gave me all the lines. Uh, and then I was like, this is fun. And I did it uh, all through um elementary school and middle school and high school. And then I went to college and like many people do, uh, I was afraid to major in theater uh, because I thought I should do something more lucrative. So I picked psychology. Okay. <laughs> not, a, not a money maker. No, not it's, really? Maker. No, oh, no. That's too bad. I know. So, uh, so part of my theater minor that I was uh, taking was improv class at the University of Florida, home of Theater Strike Force. Yeah, y'all have uh, some impressive alumni. Uh, we do. We do. We have a very impressive alumni. Uh, Bill Arnett, Danny Mora, um, many, many others, Patrick Connolly. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and, and it's, it's from what I understand, it is the largest uh, improv, uh, college improv troupe in the world. Possibly. Oh, wow. Um, it was a class and a club, and I was the president of the club. Um, you were president. Heck I yeah. was. I, I was. I, I was an academic kid, and so everything had to be like A pluses, and I had to be the president, and I had to do all that stuff. So, um, so I'm not a theater major, but I'm a theater minor, and I take improv class. And I knew what improv was. I'd seen it on TV, and I had seen, you know, I'd heard about it in in high school uh, theater class. But when I was doing it, I was like, wait a second, I can act and I don't have to like do a script analysis. Like I don't have to learn these lines and I don't have to prepare. Um, so that's what happened. I just, I, I was, I was obsessed with the fact that I could just act whenever I wanted to Nice. jump up and act. So, that, so, that so the happened. thing that got you into theater in the first place, the ability to memorize lines, you were like, oh, I don't even need that anymore. <laughs> yeah, I was done with it. I was like, this is over. Screw this stuff. Yeah. I just uh, make them up. Uh, right? Well, because, like, making it up is is you. Like, you don't have to play somebody else. You can just be ten versions of you in one show. Yeah, right. So and that, you also don't the, – the thing I love about uh, – that the theater doesn't afford you. Like, I'm not going to get to play Death of a Salesman anytime soon. And, right? yeah, and there's certain roles I've aged out of that I can't even do anymore. You know, and it's like – but at improv, I can play old man, a young person. doesn't matter. Uh, you can be a tree? I, that's a perfect tree. Thank you, so thank this you. This is my table. This is my table. Wow. I know. Method. So Very nice. Thank you. Um, so I did that all through college, and then uh, all of my friends, uh, all of my improv friends were like, well, we're moving to Chicago because that's what you do. So I was like, oh, it's, I, I, I had no other plan because of my, <laughs> my handy psychology degree gave me no other plan. So, uh, so I said to myself, I'll do that too. So I also moved to Chicago, and I started – class at IO and at Second City uh, in the uh, very beginning in like January of um, 2004. Nice. And then from then on, that was it for me. So you you got an improv just kind of because it was a class 
and you was like, I'll try it. And then you were like, I love it. And then you were like, well, I don't know what else to do. I'll go to Chicago. And then you've made a whole life, a whole career. I mean, you're, you're a huge pillar in the greater industry that is improv. Thank you. I would say I improvised my career. Well done. Thank well you. Well done. Thank you. Uh, no, but really I did. I mean, that's what you do. You know, people ask kind of how, how do you get into any kind of comedy? Uh, or or even theater or or improv and really you just show up you show up and like audition and take classes until something happens yeah so what was it about improv that like made you want to stick with it 20 years in I feel like a lot of people we know did it for a while and went that's cool I'm moving on to something else and you were like I'm in it for the long haul um I think the key is that you have to be in it for improv um because there are many people who are in it for comedy uh, or they're in it for TV or for writing. And that's awesome. Like definitely be in it for that. Um, sure. But it's easy to, if you don't get to that next step to just give up. Yeah. Um, and so for me, I was always just in love with improv and I was doing it and it was like, Oh, this happened. Like this does other things. Like this got me a commercial agent and this got me auditions and this got me this. But it was never to get those things. It was always just to do improv because uh, because improv is not just you and I know this, Rich. But for our listeners, um, improv is not just it's not just performance. It is not just uh, a job. It is not just a show. Like it's a whole life. It is a complete lifestyle. I have known people who have walked away from very lucrative careers just to do improv. Uh, or have walked away from their from their husbands and wives, like have like left people who didn't get it to do to join this cult. Yeah, I was about to say it, it's it's getting a little culty. It <laughs> really is. Like it's a lifestyle. I um I I did shows. I, I was in a class or at a show six nights a week when I was in Chicago. Yeah. You can be because that's what yeah. Chicago is, and LA. I'm sure too. Uh. But you're you're in you're in shows until 10, 11, midnight. You're at a bar until two. You go home. You wake up. You go to your day job at eight o'clock, and you do it all over again. Yeah. And that's and that's a light. It's a lifestyle. So, um, so the thing that kept me in it for twenty years, and it morphed over time for me, obviously, because what kept me in it initially was I'm getting a thing, and I'm doing a thing, and I have friends. Like I have best friends because of this. Yeah. Improv forces this intimacy where you're like best friends within days with people uh and then that sticks and it doesn't just go away uh but yeah exactly there's a community to it and um and so when you're young you're in it because i got friends i got drinks i got like <laughs> social life i'm in this to win this because it's so fun because it's like college forever but i then also grew up and like i got my big job and i lost my big job and then I got married and had kids and I shifted to being a teacher more so than a, than a performer. I was still performing uh, some, but I started more teaching and coaching and I was like, Oh, this is still improv. Like just because I'm not auditioning for the next big thing or just because I'm not performing six nights a week like I used to, I'm still like, I get to talk about improv to everybody who comes to the door and I get to, like see these young kids who are starting their little journey that I started like 10 years before that. And I get to use it with my kids. I get to like teach I've taught my kids some improv games. It's not rewarding, but <laughs> it's funny. It's very funny. Yeah. Your kids are adorable. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. And they all really over are. your social media, which is like, they, I can't help it. They want to be there. Uh, they love it. They are funny. They're so funny. Yeah. It's symbiotic. Um, it works. They're hilarious. You've got, fans so boom <laughs> give, the, give the people what they want yeah they they're my new audience for sure um but it's great because like that you know it morphed into something bigger and i got to um i left chicago over five years ago and came here to las vegas and there was like the the still the ramblings of a, of a community left here too from when second city second city was here in vegas uh up until 2008 okay um and so there was still the what was left of that community was still here and still functioning. And like in Vegas, which is not a, a traditional improv town by any means and mm -hmm. not even a theater town by any means, like you'd think it would be 
because of all the performers here. Sure. But yeah. it is weird. Uh, it's it's more performers who are here, uh, you know, with Cirque du Soleil, with Blue Man, like big companies. Yeah. And so they do like little things on the side to sort of help feed their creativity. But there's not a solid, there's a, there is a theater community here. I'm going to get in trouble. I'm going to say the wrong thing. There is a theater community here. There's no equity house here. There's no like, um, there's not a lot of like mid-sized theater here. It's yeah. all either small or it's huge. And so for improv to survive here, like the people who are still doing improv here when we got here, I, I can't give them enough credit for, for surviving the years without Second City here. Um, and sticking it out. And that's what improv is, is like them being able to stick out nothing, like having, you know, an audience of 10 people nightly and still doing it and still just being together in it and learning and reading books and watching videos and like figuring it out themselves. It was awesome. When I, got I, here. I feel like uh, over the last 10 or so years, I've seen that around, around this country and, and I haven't been able, been fortunate enough to travel much outside of the country, but I'm feeling that that's happening out there too, is it's like, it doesn't take, you don't need a second city or an IO or UCB anymore. You, you, you grass root it. You, you make yeah. a community from scratch. And I, I feel like every time I'm in Vegas, that's what it feels like is like this community banded together. It's like, we do this for the love, yeah. not because there's some job that we might get. Cause like, you know, you, I'm of yeah. Chicago. I assume for the same reason you did. Cause like we thought, you know, Oh, we'll get this big job at this big mm -hmm. thing and that will lead to other big things. And yep. it's like, you can just do improv for the sake of doing improv. It, and you have to. Because if you don't, you're not you and me anymore, Rich. Like, you're not people who stick it out. Um, not to say we haven't had our own successes. We sure, sure have. Sure. But, um, but, uh, but yeah, like, the if, if you go into improv thinking you're going to be on SNL, you're not going to stick with improv. That's not, it's not going to be fun for you. Yeah, because a lot of, there's <laughs> very few jobs on SNL. Very few jobs. A lot of people want them. Very well, people. Yeah. And some yeah. people make them. I mean, we, we certainly have had a lot of friends make that journey, but I mean, if that's the only thing you're looking for, that's disheartening. You'll die. <laughs> you're, 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 you'll die. Your <laughs> heart will die. Like something in, in you will go away. And I've watched it and I've seen so many people just like lose it because they didn't get their thing. Uh, and it's really sad. It's really sad to not just love, and I, I have to say, I feel like a big part, for me, uh, a big part of keeping that love is being a teacher. Yeah. It's not just playing. It's not just showing up and playing. It's, it's like actually seeing it change a life. I feel like you and I have, uh, we've very similar, not the same, but similar journeys. We've been at it almost the same amount of time. We were almost in Chicago at the same. I got Chicago a year later than you. Uh, mm -hmm. and, uh, not to disparage any individuals or anything, but I feel like there was, um, there were, there have been people, uh, who teach improv because they were aiming for SNL or something big and they didn't have anything else to do. And they're like, I guess I'll teach, but You'll teach yeah. For money. yeah. And, and, uh, whenever I ran into those people, it was very, um, disheartening, but I feel like now there's so much more, there's people like us who like love teaching can you talk about the transition between being a performer who was on a performer track to what it was like to to go into teaching and then what it was like to kind of make that more of your focus than the performing itself yeah so uh i feel like i i think many improvisers feel or i hope many improvisers feel which is i was never ready to teach mm -hmm. uh i started improvising in 2000 and I and I started learning and growing and I started taking classes in Chicago in 2004 and I uh, went through those classes and I played on a ton of teams and I and I wrote shows and I wrote sketch shows and then uh, around 2007 I think was the first time I was like asked to potentially coach or teach by comedy sports wow. uh, and I want to say I, I want to give comedy sports every every ounce of credit deserves because they were the first people to hire me. Uh, I, I had my first real improv job from comedy sports. And then I had my first real like kind of offer to be a teacher and a coach from comedy sports as well. But I went from 2000 to 2007, seven years of solid living the improv life. Uh, and when somebody asked me to teach, I was like, what? what? Was like, no, <laughs> no, 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 not me. I can't. I'm, I don't know anything. Uh, and, you know, 
depending on what it is, if you do something for seven years, you, you may or may not be able to teach it. I mean, it depends on if it's like brain surgery or, or, or gin rummy. I don't know, whatever you sure, sure. want to teach. But for improv, um, I, I didn't feel ready at all. And I think it was some, I think it was one of the, one of the students, one of my students at, uh, or not students yet, but one of the younger people at, at, uh, who was going through rec league classes or going through classes at, um, uh, comedy sports asked, asked me to coach. And I was like, whoa, not qualified. And then <laughs> I realized like, well, I've watched like a thousand shows and I've been in hundreds of them. I could probably watch something and say what I think about it. Yeah. So I just had to do it. And when I did it, I realized I had like a million ideas and everything was coming together. And so my first opportunity to coach and teach, I was like, oh God, I can actually do this. Like I know what I'm talking about. Uh, this is amazing. And it's not going to be everybody's you know, journey. I mean, seven years could be like a minute to one person and it could be 10,000 years to another person. But, sure. um, but I realized that that's, that that's how it had to go for me. I had to just do it. I couldn't think about it. Uh, which is just, which is exactly what improv is, I guess. Just doing and not thinking. <laughs> You're telling um, me you just went in and just did something? Weird. That's I just, just did it I don't, without I don't planning. Understand. I don't get it. I didn't plan. You didn't uh, write so it and memorize it? <laughs> I didn't. I had, well, I had, I had scripts. Actually, funny story. Probably before I went into my very first coaching, I did write things down. I wrote like out lines that I remember that other teachers had said I wrote quotes from Michael Gelman and from and from Susan Messing and from all these teachers I had had and I was like I got to remember to tell them this um and then just like when you're standing on a back line planning something I went into that class and I didn't, I didn't even look at that note at those notes I didn't even look at them because yeah. why uh so sure so then I went, uh, so then from there, um, I became, uh, I went on a cruise ship right away for Second City uh, at that point. So I had to kind of abandon my my teaching goals. Uh, and to just to clarify board. for everyone uh, who's watching, being on a cruise ship meant doing a couple of improv shows, a couple of sketch shows. You were you were like part of the entertainment doing a bunch of different things yes. for Second City. Yes. Uh, back in our day, it only meant a couple of shows. <laughs> and, then, and then as things moved on, it meant more work, but... But yes, uh, so I was on on the Norwegian cruise lines for um, for Second City, and and we had to teach a workshop there uh, on a couple of occasions. We didn't teach it every week, um, so I started. I, I got a little bit of that in there too. And then when I came back, uh, I was full. I was a full understudy, not a full touring company member, but I was an understudy for the touring company. Of Second City, uh, and, yeah, of Second City. And then I was also still working for comedy sports and I started to become a full-time teacher. I was teaching improv uh, level three for comedy sports. Uh, or one, uh, one and three. I taught both, both of them. Um, maybe I started at one, but, uh, but so I was, I was now um, uh, improvising and learning sketch shows on the spot uh, a couple times a week. Uh, I was, improvising like two or three or four or six times a week for comedy sports and doing remotes. And then I was also teaching once or twice a week for comedy sports as well. And just so, to clarify, remote gigs at comedy sports at that time meant doing offsite shows for pay as opposed to shows at the theater. Yeah. Yeah. Like you. bar mitzvahs and um, stuff like that. Bar mitzvahs, so many bar mitzvahs. We did uh, a lot of bar mitzvahs and bar mitzvahs. Yeah. A lot of 10 year old birthday parties, a lot of uh, Harry Styles references that I didn't know. Uh, at the time. I remember the high school musical references were strong back then. They Twilight. were. I didn't know anything <laughs> about that stuff. I was just like in sync guys. And they were like, we don't know who that is. We don't. Mm. Too old. Boomer. Um, <laughs> it was over. Uh, so um, I was do. I, I think that my transition into teaching was much easier while I was also a full-time performer because I was able to translate in real time what was going on on stage for me into yeah. what was going on for my students on stage. And it so also, I, I think that gives you some clout, right? Like it, it helps oh, to go, totally. oh, like I like why, you know, I don't, I'm sure you probably haven't had any students do this, but like, I, I feel like the fear for every teacher is that some students going to go, well, who the hell are you to teach me? Exactly. I'm like, well, I'm the person who's performing, you know, t touring with Second City and Friday. doing this. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And I could say like, we're do. I, let's work on this tonight and I will show you on stage Friday what this looks like. Yeah. Uh, and that was awesome to do. Uh, and then, yeah, it, it, Second City has that name and that um, brand, especially in Chicago, but also, you know, one of the few that has it outside of Chicago, too. And so 
so yeah, when you say Second City, you get a little bit of credibility. Uh, uh, also, an adorable, <laughs> adorable anecdote was that I was um, I came to watch a student performance at Comedy Sports uh, because I had some friends in it, or a friend coached it, or I can't remember, but I was there to support. Sure. And I was sitting in the front row because I made it a point to come and sit in the front row. Because you're shows. a good theater goer, a good <laughs> improviser. Nobody sits in the front row. Uh, I came to sit in the front row. I was wearing my, I think it was still cold outside. So I was like wearing my, my scarf and everything. And I'm just kind of sitting there being a, being an improv, being an improv, uh, supporter. Mm -hmm. And during a dance break and rich, I'll, I'll define dance break. For you. <laughs> um, at comedy sports and at any good short form show, you have some music in between every, uh, every game to kind of keep energy up. And that's when the improvisers should be dancing. They should be taking their dance break time right so literally during a dance break the music goes a, a scene gets called music goes blaring a kid on stage in the show and when i say kid he's probably like 22 uh <laughs> runs off stage to me and goes you're on torco and i go yeah i am and he goes awesome and he gets back on stage and like wow. goes on with the show and that was during the dance break and i could not have felt more fucking <laughs> ego in that moment than ever. I mean, that was bigger to me than getting hired by anybody. Than like, I was just like, this kid has seen me in a show and he is now excited that I'm at his show. And that yeah. was the cutest thing I had ever experienced in my life as an improviser. And that kid's name was Barack Obama. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> he looked so young back <laughs> then before he was president. He's yeah. aged so much. He he's he's a, he's a good guy. Um, so okay, let's let's get into the nitty gritty. Um, what's one of the most important? I I I hate ever, ever said like your favorite or the most important. Or maybe you have one, but like, what is one thing that you know people who take classes from Natalie Shipman? What's one thing that uh, you want them to come away with, if nothing else? Like, what's that nugget of wisdom? Uh, the thing, two things. I got it's got to be two things. Fine. Uh, feel something. Feel something. Uh, actually, I'm going to round it out and make it three things because rule of three. <laughs> feel something Great. Um, is what I tell people when they're on stage. That's a, actually a, a common side coaching, uh, which is when we yell at people during their scene work during classes is side coaching. Um, most common side coaching for me is is you have to feel something. Uh, what is going? What's really going on here? Uh, don't stand and talk to each other. He just said that that he stole your car. W don't talk to me about what you're making for lunch with your cool object work. Right. Like, react to that. Yeah. Feel something uh, is what people hear from me. Uh, two is um, uh, know this about you. Um, because... Like I said earlier, when we're not working with a script, we're working with every experience we've ever had in our whole lives. So your script is your life experience. So know this about you. Um, and that just means that when somebody says something to you and you react in a certain way, that's going to be how you react most of the time. So, so that's a thing. Nice. Uh, and, um, and then uh, uh, classic, classic Natalie that third thing that I just said I was going to give you, no idea what it was, but it'll come back to me. I'll always be prepared to not know what you're doing. How about that? I, yeah, yeah. Don't promise people anything. That's that's <laughs> going to be a thing. I promise you three things, and uh, here we are at two. There so, it is. Um, uh, can, can you talk about? Uh, do, do you do you? Um, still teach both short form and long form? Do you see them as two different things or, or are they weaved interwovenly in your teachings or talk to me about that? I'm so glad you asked. Uh, I do teach both. However, I have a favorite and you may guess which is my favorite based on our comedy sports days. Uh, short form is my favorite. So um, I will choose sides and I will take short form as a side and choosing sides doesn't necessarily make them two separate things for me. Um, it's all seam work. It's yeah. all seam work. And, and I think that's a mistake people make coming in. That's a, a perception people have that's, that's a misconception is um, they're not different. They're, it, it's not different improv. Uh, it's different rules. And that's yeah. fun. Uh, long form is just you're still running by guidelines, even if you're not running by rules that the audience has heard 
handed out beforehand. Um, but to treat a game like it's not a scene is a huge mistake. Yeah. Uh, and it's really hard to watch people do that, uh, is to go, well, I was playing New Choice, so I didn't care who I was or how I felt. So, well, no, it's not, really? <laughs> not what's happening. Uh, so there's that. Um, but I, I'm more comfortable with short form because uh, I like to dance, number one. Um, because I love song and impro, I, I love song games. Uh, I love ga- I love games because a game is there for a reason. I am a Viola Spolin fan, uh, to say the least, and she created the games for a reason. She created uh, theater games. Please Google Viola Spolin, everybody. If you don't know who Viola Spolin is, we're not going to explain it. She's the godmother of improv. Just yeah. Google. <laughs> we, we can't get into it right now. But uh, but she created theater games, and she created them to teach people how to communicate. Uh, and and the games, every game, break, it, break down every improv game you've ever seen or played. Every game's rules are there to move the scene forward. They're not there for comedy. Or they weren't. They are now. Yeah. But they weren't there for comedy initially. They were there to facilitate communication which is why to me now teaching so important because everything's about facilitating communication and we're having fun on the side and we're being clever on the side and we're and we're entertaining on the side but ultimately we're like pushing a scene forward and can you do that in long form of course you can but you're given a map in short form to do that and i think and you know maybe it's just i'm biased but i i feel like many long form performers who are also short form performers, like you can really see the difference in how we approach long form because of our short form experience and background. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. It's just, it's this versus this. Yeah. And there's nothing wrong with long form performance. Never done short form by any stretch. There's some amazingly talented people out there, but, uh, mm-hmm. uh, but I, I, whenever I'm in long form, if I ever feel anything, I rely on my short form instincts to just, and I get right there. Yeah, just do something. Do you, something. You have to. That'll be the third thing. Just do just something. Do something. <laughs> uh, so one of the reasons why I'm I, I'm creating this show and, and putting it out there and uh, is because I really believe like improv is an industry that n- very few people have treated it like an industry. You know, we don't have conferences. We don't have. Con- continuing education we don't have we don't have a lot of formality uh to it and maybe maybe we never will but i I think that i what i'm seeing now uh and i'm seeing it with you i'm seeing with a lot of other people is that we're we're starting to formalize a little bit more with more content talking about it more treating it a little more seriously it's no longer just that thing you do on saturdays but it's like people are making a living off of it now i mean fresh uh from a less than a month ago now you can be on tv as an improviser which before you know it wasn't that at all. Can you talk about, I think you have uh, six or seven videos that you've made, your improv bits videos? I do, yeah. Yeah, can you talk about those and like the impetus for making them and, and, and your purpose for them, your goals? Yes. So I've been under quarantine. Anybody else? <laughs> Never heard of it. Okay, great. Um, I, I've been at home uh, from work. Um, I, uh, I, I am both, both my works. So I was working as a full-time teacher and coach and performer, um, at the theater, uh, Vegas theater hub. And then, um, I'm also a personal trainer I've been working at a gym. Uh, it, it's a, it's a nationwide brand. Don't worry about it. But, um, uh, so I'm home from, so the gym's been closed, uh, and I, I've been home and in that time, uh, I started to wonder, like, kind of, well, what are people doing out there um, for improv? And, of course, that question was answered very quickly. I mean, people have been doing shows online. They've been doing classes online. Uh, you've been teaching online, right, mm-hmm. Rich? You did some online teaching. You do. Um, I've done a couple of workshops online. Um, and so just out of sheer t- time timeliness, uh, just because there's a lot, um, there's been just a lot of time at home. Uh, I, I, I'm not a video person, but I started making these videos because I wanted to remind people kind of what, what are the important lessons of improv and, and how can we hold on to them right now? And how can we hold on to them as humans right now? (gasps) That's my third thing. Be a human is what I tell people. Be a human. That's what I tell people on stage. I'm, I'm more, I'm more, um, explicit in my language about it, but, uh, be a human. Is what nice. I say. So, uh, so that's my that's my note for people. But, um, but that that's being lost right now because we are stuck inside because we're not at work because we're going crazy because we're all scared. 
a lot of our humanity is is either really really showing up or really being uh, pressed down and improv was an outlet for people before this so how much more of an outlet do we need now um and so my uh so, so, so since the theater part of what i do is shut down um i was also co-founder of a, of a separate uh business that was more more pointed at um business uh training and coaching um called vegas improv power and what we have what i've developed over time um my so my partner ryan and i uh have both been working through vegas improv power um what we've developed over over time is a thing called uh, functional improvisation. Nice. Um, and functional improvisation came from my background as a as a trainer, uh, because in training, my very favorite th- way to train people is through functional exercise. And if you don't know what that is, functional exercise is um, s- squats and push ups and and lifting and putting things over your head and doing things that your body naturally does. Versus mm-hmm. like sitting in a machine and doing a bicep curl, like when do we do this in life? But actually like picking up a heavy weight and throwing it on the ground, that's functional training. Nice. So it teaches your body to do things it needs to do anyway. Um, functional improv is sort of what I consider kind of a cousin or a friend of applied improv, where we put improv toward business and toward education a lot of times now. Like that's a thing where people make money. Yeah. Um, yeah. Functional improv was more something that I want to bring to people in their lives. Like, are you scared to go out on a date or are you scared to change jobs or uh, do you struggle at home with, uh, you know, your relationships? Um, I actually was able to do a pilot program for, um, for the second city out here in Vegas uh, for a thing called improv for caregivers. Oh, wow. um, it was written by uh, by Ann, Ann Libera at Second City, and it um, was one of the best human beings on the on the planet. By the way, um, one of my mentors, absolutely, yeah. Ann Libera. Shout out, we love you. Amazing. Um, she she put this program together, obviously with Kelly as well, and um, and uh, they reached out to a brain clinic here. Uh, well, it's national, but the one that happens to be here. Um, it's a longer story to it and I don't want to, I don't want to mess up their branding. But, um, the point is, is that I was able to teach, um, improv for, for, for caregivers who are family members who stay at home with people with brain dysfunction, such as Alzheimer's and, um, and dementia. And that is real. Like that is what improv is for. It is to teach people how to talk to their spouse who doesn't know who they are anymore uh, and who who doesn't know that it's morning instead of night or what year it is. And how do you use improv skills to say yes and to someone who literally has no grip on reality? Um, Damn. And so that's the kind of stuff. I, I, I cried every week that we wow. talked about. Wow. Um, and people sat down and said like, I, you know, I live with my, my husband of 50 years who doesn't know who I am anymore and I'm here. And, Ooh. and uh, yeah, it's, it was incredible. And we were using, and we we're playing red ball with those people. <laughs> and, and we play red ball, which is a, an improv exercise, you guys, with this big red ball. Um, and, and then we would talk for 20 minutes after red ball about how they were going to go home and like practice this principle with their, with their dad or their husband or their, the person that they can't communicate with anymore. And so that to me is what functional improvisation is, is it's, it's, it's something that you carry with you all the time. It's not about performing. It's not about getting on TV. It's not about, uh, it's not even about like, you know, making friends at the bar, although you can still do that. Um, but it's about life. Wow. That's, uh, I mean, I'm sold. I'm in, I love, I now love functional improv. I've never heard of it before eight minutes ago. Now, now I'm, now I'm a disciple. Please visit our website. It's functionalimprov.co. That's a real thing. So oh, great. Yeah, but, yeah, and I'll I'll link all that, uh, all all of your your links uh, at the yeah. bottom because you got a lot, um, including uh, Vegas Improv Power. That's I'm gonna link that. Uh, that's your is is that functional or is that more corporate? Yeah. Uh, it is. It is more corporate. Uh, we're. I mean, it's obviously it's something that we we work with together. So it's kind of 
blended in together, but it is more corporate. Yeah. Excellent. So you do co- corporate improv, functional improv, you teach performers, you Ooh. perform, you've got your improv bits out there. A lot of resources for people to check out. I just want to say, uh, uh, I want to say a huge thank you to you because oh, this is so fun. Thank you for having me on this. Um, and, uh, and, and, uh, there is a lot of improv in Vegas, you guys, and it's going on and people are, are doing the, the thing, all the things. And, and it's just like you said earlier, like kind of all we need is a room, you know, it doesn't have to be the big, the big stage of, of all the famous places. It can just be a room. I love it. Natalie Shipman. So good to see you. So good to improvise with you. So good to talk with you. Thanks so much for being on. Thank you, Rich. Thank you so much for watching. Links to everything Natalie plug are in the comments below. Also in the comments, if you have any questions about improv or anything improv related, uh, please ask, because I want to do some solo episodes every once in a while where I just answer questions. If you'd like to be notified every time I drop a new one of these, just subscribe to the channel and click the little bell icon and YouTube will let you know. Thanks, improvisers, and keep making each other look good.